Chapter Five of the Picture of Dorian Gray by Oscar Wilde. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Bob Newfeld. Mother, mother, I am so happy," whispered the girl, burying her face in the lap of the faded, tired-looking woman who, with back turned to the shrill, intrusive light was sitting in the one armchair that their dingy sitting-room contained. "'I am so happy,' she repeated. "'And you must be happy, too.' Mrs. Vane winced, and put her thin, bismuth-whitened hands on her daughter's head. "'Happy?' she echoed. "'I am only happy, Sybil, when I see you act. You must not think of anything but your acting.' Mr. Isaacs has been very good to us, and we owe him money." The girl looked up and pouted. "'Money, mother!' she cried. "'What does money matter? Love is more than money. Mr. Isaacs has advanced us fifty pounds to pay off our debts and to get a proper outfit for James. You must not forget that, Sybil. Fifty pounds is a very large sum. Mr. Isaacs has been most considerate. "'He is not a gentleman, mother, and I hate the way he talks to me,' said the girl, rising to her feet and going over to the window. "'I don't know how we could manage without him,' answered the elder woman querulously. Sybil Vane tossed her head and laughed. "'We don't want him any more, mother. Prince Charming rules life for us now.' Then she paused. A rose shook in her blood and shadowed her cheeks. Quick breath parted the petals of her lips. They trembled. Some southern wind of passion swept over her and stirred the dainty folds of her dress. "'I love him,' she said simply. "'Foolish child, foolish child,' was the parrot phrase flung in answer. The waving of crooked, false-jeweled fingers gave grotesqueness to the words. The girl laughed again. The joy of a caged bird was in her voice. Her eyes caught the melody and echoed it in radiance, then closed for a moment, as though to hide their secret. When they opened, the mist of a dream had passed across them. Thin-lipped wisdom spoke at her from the worn chair, hinted at prudence, quoted from that book of cowardice whose author apes the name of common sense. She did not listen. She was free in her prison of passion. Her prince, Prince Charming, was with her. She had called on memory to remake him. She had set her soul to search for him, and it had brought him back. His kiss burned again upon her mouth. Her eyelids were warm with his breath. Then wisdom altered its method, and spoke of espial and discovery. This young man might be rich. If so, marriage should be thought of. Against the shell of her ear broke the waves of worldly cunning. The arrows of craft shot by her. She saw the thin lips moving, and smiled. Suddenly she felt the need to speak. The wordy silence troubled her. "'Mother! Mother!' she cried. "'Why does he love me so much? I know why I love him. I love him because he is like what love himself should be. But what does he see in me? I am not worthy of him. And yet, why, I cannot tell, though I feel so much beneath him, I don't feel humble. I feel proud, terribly proud. Mother, did you love my father as I love Prince Charming?" The elder woman grew pale beneath the coarse powder that daubed her cheeks, and her dry lips twitched with a spasm of pain. Sybil rushed to her, flung her arms around her neck, and kissed her. "'Forgive me, mother. I know it pains you to talk about our father, but it only pains you because you loved him so much. Don't look so sad. I am as happy today as you were twenty years ago. Oh, let me be happy forever. 
my child you are far too young to think of falling in love besides what do you know of this young man you don't even know his name the whole thing is most inconvenient and really when james is going away to australia and i have so much to think of i must say that you should have shown more consideration however as i said before if he is rich ah oh, mother mother let me be happy mrs vane glanced at her and with one of those false theatrical gestures that so often become a mode of second nature to a stage player clasped her in her arms at this moment the door opened and a young lad with rough brown hair came into the room he was thick set of figure and his hands and feet were large and somewhat clumsy in movement he was not so finely bred as his sister one would hardly have guessed the close relationship that existed between them mrs vane fixed her eyes on him and intensified her smile she mentally elevated her son to the dignity of an audience she felt sure that the tableau was interesting you might keep some of your kisses from me sybil i think said the lad with a good-natured grumble ah but you don't like being kissed jim she cried you are a dreadful old bear and she ran across the room and hugged him james vane looked into his sister's face with tenderness i want you to come out with me for a walk sybil i don't suppose i shall ever see this horrid london again i am sure i don't want to my son don't say such dreadful things murmured mrs vane taking up a tawdry theatrical dress with a sigh and beginning to patch it she felt a little disappointed that he had not joined the group it would have increased the theatrical picturesqueness of the situation why not mother i mean it you pain me my son i trust you will return from australia in a position of affluence i believe there is no society of any kind in the colonies nothing that i would call society so when you have made your fortune you must come back and assert yourself in london society muttered the lad i don't want to know anything about that i should like to make some money to take you and sybil off the stage i hate it oh jim said sybil laughing how unkind of you but are you really going for a walk with me that will be nice i was afraid you were going to say good-bye to some of your friends to tom hardy who gave you that hideous pipe or ned langton who makes fun of you for smoking it it is very sweet of you to let me have your last afternoon where shall we go let us go to the park oh, i am too shabby he said frowning only swell people go to the park nonsense jim she whispered stroking the sleeve of his coat he hesitated for a moment very well he said at last but don't be too long dressing she danced out of the door one could hear her singing as she ran upstairs her little feet pattered overhead he walked up and down the room two or three times then he turned to the still figure in the chair mother are my things ready he asked quite ready james she said keeping her eyes on her work for some months past she had felt ill at ease when she was alone with this rough stern son of hers her shallow secret nature was troubled when their eyes met she used to wonder if he suspected anything the silence for he made no other observation became intolerable to her she began to complain women defend themselves by attacking just as they attack by sudden and strange surrenders i hope you will be contented james with your seafaring life she said you must remember that it is your own choice you might have entered a solicitor's office solicitors are a very respectable class in the country often dine with the best families i hate offices and i hate clerks he replied but you are quite right i have chosen my own life 
All I say is, watch over Sybil. Don't let her come to any harm. Mother, you must watch over her. James, you really talk very strangely. Of course I watch over Sybil. I hear a gentleman comes every night to the theatre and goes behind to talk to her. Is that right? What about that? You are speaking of things you don't understand, James. In the profession we are accustomed to receive a great deal of most gratifying attention. I myself used to receive many bouquets at one time. That was when acting was really understood. As for Sybil, I do not know at present whether her attachment is serious or not. But there is no doubt that the young man in question is a perfect gentleman. He is always most polite to me. Besides, he has the appearance of being rich, and the flowers he sends are lovely. "'You don't know his name, though,' said the lad harshly. "'No,' answered his mother, with a placid expression in her face. "'He has not yet revealed his real name. I think it is quite romantic of him. He is probably a member of the aristocracy.' James Vane bit his lip. "'Watch over Sybil, mother,' he cried watch over her my son you distress me very much sibyl is always under my special care of course if this gentleman is wealthy there is no reason why she should not contract an alliance with him i trust he is one of the aristocracy he has all the appearance of it i must say it might be a most brilliant marriage for sibyl they would make a charming couple. His good looks are really quite remarkable. Everybody notices them. The lad muttered something to himself and drummed on the window-pane with his coarse fingers. He had just turned round to say something when the door opened and Sybil ran in. "'How serious you both are!' she cried. "'What is the matter?' "'Nothing,' he answered. "'I suppose one must be serious sometimes. Good-bye, mother. I will have my dinner at five o'clock. Everything is packed except my shirts, so you need not trouble. Good-bye, my son, she answered with a bow of strained stateliness. She was extremely annoyed at the tone he had adopted with her, and there was something in his look that made her feel afraid. Kiss me, mother, said the girl. Her flower-like lips touched the withered cheek and warmed its frost. "'My child! My child!' cried Mrs. Vane, looking up to the ceiling in search of an imaginary gallery. "'Come, Sybil,' said her brother impatiently. He hated his mother's affectations. They went out into the flickering, wind-blown sunlight and strolled down the dreary Euston Road. The passer-by glanced in wonder at the sullen, heavy youth who, in coarse, ill-fitting clothes, was in the company of such a graceful, refined-looking girl. He was like a common gardener walking with a rose. Jim frowned from time to time when he caught the inquisitive glance of some stranger. He had that dislike of being stared at which comes on geniuses late in life and never leaves the commonplace. Sybil, however, was quite unconscious of the effect she was producing. Her love was trembling in laughter on her lips. She was thinking of Prince Charming, and that she might think of him all the more, she did not talk of him, but prattled on about the ship in which Jim was going to sail, about the gold he was certain to find, about the wonderful heiress whose life he was to save from the wicked red-shirted bush rangers for he was not to remain a sailor or a supercargo or whatever he was going to be oh no a sailor's existence was dreadful fancy being cooped up in a horrid ship with the hoarse humpbacked waves trying to get in and a black wind blowing the masts down and tearing the sails into long screaming ribbons he was to leave the vessel at melbourne bid a polite good-bye to the captain, and go off at once to the gold-fields. Before a week was over he was to come across a large nugget of pure gold, the largest nugget that had ever been discovered, 
and bring it down to the coast in a wagon guarded by six mounted policemen. The bushrangers were to attack them three times and be defeated with immense slaughter. Or, no, he was not to go to the gold fields at all. They were horrid places where men got intoxicated and shot each other in bar-rooms and used bad language. He was to be a nice sheep farmer, and one evening, as he was riding home, he was to see the beautiful heiress being carried off by a robber on a black horse, and give chase and rescue her. Of course she would fall in love with him, and he with her, and they would get married and come home and live in an immense house in London. Yes, there were delightful things in store for him, but he must be very good and not lose his temper or spend his money foolishly. She was only a year older than he was, but she knew so much more of life. He must be sure, also, to write to her by every mail, and to say his prayers each night before he went to sleep. God was very good, and would watch over him. She would pray for him, too, and in a few years he would come back quite rich and happy. The lad listened sulkily to her, and made no answer. He was heartsick at leaving home. Yet it was not this alone that made him gloomy and morose. Inexperienced though he was, he had still a strong sense of the danger of Sybil's position. This young dandy who was making love to her could mean her no good. He was a gentleman, and he hated him for that, hated him through some curious race instinct for which he could not account and which, for that reason, was all the more dominant within him. He was conscious also of the shallowness and vanity of his mother's nature, and in that saw infinite peril for Sybil and Sybil's happiness. Children begin by loving their parents. As they grow older, they judge them. Sometimes they forgive them. His mother. He had something on his mind to ask of her something he had brooded on for many months of silence. A chance phrase that he had heard at the theatre, a whispered sneer that had reached his ears one night as he waited at the stage door, had set loose a train of horrible thoughts. He remembered it as if it had been the lash of a hunting crop across his face, his brows knit together like a wedge-like furrow, and with a twitch of pain he bit his under lip. "'You are not listening to a word I am saying, Jim,' cried Sybil, "'and I am making the most delightful plans for your future. Do say something.' "'What do you want me to say?' "'Oh, that you will be a good boy and not forget us,' she answered, smiling at him. He shrugged his shoulders. "'You are more likely to forget me than I am to forget you, Sybil.' She flushed. "'What do you mean, Jim?' she asked. "'You have a new friend, I hear. Who is he? Why have you not told me about him? He means you no good.' "'Stop, Jim!' she exclaimed. "'You must not say anything against him. I love him.' "'Why, you don't even know his name,' answered the lad. "'Who is he? I have a right to know.' "'He is called Prince Charming. Don't you like the name?' Oh, you silly boy, you should never forget it. If you only saw him, you would think him the most wonderful person in the world. Some day you will meet him, when you come back from Australia. You will like him so much. Everybody likes him, and I love him. I wish you could come to the theatre tonight. He is going to be there, and I am going to play Juliet. Oh, how I shall play it! Fancy, Jim, to be in love and play Juliet, to have him sitting there to play for his delight. I am afraid I may frighten the company, or frighten or enthrall them. To be in love is to surpass oneself. Poor dreadful Mr. Isaacs will be shouting genius to his loafers at the bar. He has preached me as a dogma. Tonight, he will announce me as a revelation. I feel it. 
and it is all his his only prince charming my wonderful lover my god of graces but i am poor beside him poor what does that matter when poverty creeps in at the door love flies in through the window our proverbs want rewriting they were made in winter and it is summer now springtime for me i think a very dance of blossoms in blue skies he is a gentleman said the lad sullenly a prince she cried musically what more do you want he wants to enslave you i shudder at the thought of being free i want you to beware of him to see him is to worship him to know him is to trust him sibyl you are mad about him she laughed and took his arm you dear old jim you talk as if you were a hundred some day you will be in love yourself then you will know what it is don't look so sulky surely you should be glad to think that though you are going away you leave me happier than i have ever been before life has been hard for us both terribly hard and difficult but it will be different now you are going to a new world and i have found one here are two chairs let us sit down and see the smart people go by they took their seats amidst a crowd of watchers the tulip beds across the road flamed like throbbing rings of fire a white dust tremulous cloud of orris root it seemed hung in the panting air the brightly colored parasols danced and dipped like monstrous butterflies she made her brother talk of himself his hopes his prospects he spoke slowly and with effort they passed words to each other as players at a game pass counters sibyl felt oppressed she could not communicate her joy a faint smile curving that sullen mouth was all the echo she could win after some time she became silent suddenly she caught a glimpse of golden hair and laughing lips and in an open carriage with two ladies dorian gray drove past she started to her feet there he is she cried who said jim vane prince charming she answered looking after the victoria he jumped up and seized her roughly by the arm show him to me which is he point him out i must see him he exclaimed but at that moment the duke of berwick's foreign hand came between and when it had left the space clear the carriage had swept out of the park he is gone murmured sibyl sadly i wish you had seen him i wish i had for as sure as there is a god in heaven if he ever does you any wrong i shall kill him she looked at him in horror he repeated his words they cut the air like a dagger the people round began to gape a lady standing close to her tittered come away jim come away she whispered he followed her doggedly as she passed through the crowd he felt glad at what he had said when they reached the achilles statue she turned round there was pity in her eyes that became laughter on her lips she shook her head at him you are foolish jim utterly foolish and a bad-tempered boy that is all how can you say such horrible things you don't know what you are talking about you are simply jealous and unkind ah oh, i wish you would fall in love love makes people good and what you said was wicked i am sixteen he answered and i know what i am about mother is no help to you she doesn't understand how to look after you i wish now that i was not going to australia at all i have a great mind to chuck the whole thing up i would if my articles hadn't been signed 
oh don't be so serious jim you are like one of the heroes of those silly melodramas mother used to be so fond of acting in i am not going to quarrel with you i have seen him and oh to see him is perfect happiness we won't quarrel i know you would never harm any one i love would you not as long as you love him i suppose was the sullen answer i shall love him forever she cried and he for ever too he had better she shrank from him then she laughed and put her hand on his arm he was merely a boy at the marble arch they hailed an omnibus which left them close to their shabby home in the euston road it was after five o'clock and sybil had to lie down for a couple of hours before acting jim insisted that she should do so he said that he would sooner part with her when their mother was not present she would be sure to make a scene and he detested scenes of every kind in sybil's own room they parted there was jealousy in the lad's heart and a fierce murderous hatred of the stranger who as it seemed to him had come between them yet when her arms were flung around his neck and her fingers strayed through his hair he softened and kissed her with real affection there were tears in his eyes as he went downstairs his mother was waiting for him below she grumbled at his unpunctuality as he entered he made no answer but sat down to his meagre meal the flies buzzed round the table and crawled over the stained cloth through the rumble of omnibuses and the clatter of street cabs he could hear the droning voice devouring each minute that was left to him after some time he thrust away his plate and put his head in his hands he felt that he had a right to know it should have been told to him before if it was as he suspected leaden with fear his mother watched him words dropped mechanically from her lips a tattered lace handkerchief twitched in her fingers when the clock struck six he got up and went to the door then he turned back and looked at her their eyes met in hers he saw a wild appeal for mercy it enraged him mother i have something to ask you he said her eyes wandered vaguely about the room she made no answer tell me the truth i have a right to know were you married to my father she heaved a deep sigh it was a sigh of relief the terrible moment the moment that night and day for weeks and months she had dreaded had come at last and yet she felt no terror indeed in some measure it was a disappointment to her the vulgar directness of the question called for a direct answer the situation had not been gradually led up to it was crude it reminded her of a bad rehearsal no she answered wondering at the harsh simplicity of life my father was a scoundrel then cried the lad clenching his fists she shook her head i knew he was not free we loved each other very much if he had lived he would have made provision for us don't speak against him my son he was your father and a gentleman indeed he was highly connected an oath broke from his lips i don't care for myself he exclaimed but don't let sibyl it is a gentleman isn't it who is in love with her or says he is highly connected too i suppose for a moment a hideous sense of humiliation came over the woman her head drooped she wiped her eyes with shaking hands sibyl has a mother she murmured i had none the lad was touched he went towards her and stooping down he kissed her i am sorry if i have pained you by asking about my father he said 
but I could not help it. I must go now. Goodbye. Don't forget that you have only one child now to look after, and believe me that if this man wrongs my sister, I will find out who he is, track him down, and kill him like a dog. I swear it. The exaggerated folly of the threat, the passionate gesture that accompanied it, the mad melodramatic words, made life seem more vivid to her. She was familiar with the atmosphere. She breathed more freely, and for the first time for many months she really admired her son. She would have liked to have continued the scene on the same emotional scale, but he cut her short. Trunks had to be carried down, and mufflers looked for. The lodging-house drudge bustled in and out. There was the bargaining with the cabman. The moment was lost in vulgar details. It was with a renewed feeling of disappointment that she waved the tattered lace handkerchief from the window as her son drove away. She was conscious that a great opportunity had been wasted. She consoled herself by telling Sybil how desolate she felt her life would be now that she had only one child to look after. She remembered the phrase. It had pleased her. Of the threat she said nothing. It was vividly and dramatically expressed. She felt that they would all laugh at it some day. End of chapter 5